because Tupac, after he left the New African Panthers, he had a new agenda, which was what he developed with his, you know, uh, imprisoned Black Panther was his black activist father, Matulu Shakur, which was to uh, pretend to be a gangster in order to appeal to gangs and politicize them because Tupac's Black Panther extended family were getting the Bloods and Crips in Los Angeles to call peace truces and turn on to activism and fight racism. And this started just before, really days before the L.A. riots. And it was kind of inspired by, you know, the Rodney King beating by the police that, you know, was such blatant, horrible police brutality. But they were being successful, the Black Panthers and Tupac were successful at getting these, uh, you know, different gang leaders throughout Los Angeles and then throughout California to call peace truces and turn on to activism. And that was spreading throughout the country. And that was taking loads of dealers off the streets and turning them on to actually legal activities. There's so many gangs actually stopped drug dealing to the point that uh, the um, Latin Kings in New York City, the, the largest gang in New York City, they have followed suit with that. Young Lords, the um, Latina version of the Black Panthers, influenced King Tone, Antonio King Tone Fernandez, to, to get his gang, the Latin Kings, to stop drug dealing and, and turn on to activism. So I showed the evidence that took billions of dollars out of the pockets of the CIA drug traffickers and even more money out of the uh, money launderers in the banks and the multinational corporations that launder all this drug money. Oh, I see. That's where the connection is. So you, what you're saying yeah. is that their supply was actually facilitated in part by the system, and then the system itself is also responsible for a huge part of the monetary workings and, yeah. and it turns it helps turn the gears and so the, all the people yeah when you get big money involved with almost anything and someone wants to shut off the tap it's going to upset somebody that's right. for sure yes wow okay and so a, a high level police officer named Russell Poole stumbled upon what was going on in Death Row Records and he, he said he found that dozens of his fellow Los Angeles police officers were working at all levels of Death Row Records and he says what are they doing there he asked his bosses and, he, and they told him, you can call them uh, uh, troubleshooters or covert agents. And so this was reprinted in a book called Labyrinth about uh, Russell Poole and the whole Los Angeles Police Rampart scandal that evolved out of Russell Poole's investigation of death row records and Tupac and Biggie's deaths. So that book revealed a lot. Um, Nick Broomfield's Biggie and Tupac film revealed a lot of what Russell Poole found. And three top Hollywood actors... First, it was um, Sylvester Stallone tried to do a movie based, you know, and he was going to play Russell Poole, and it was announced in all the you know local movie magazines and all that, and it was canned. And then Leonardo DiCaprio was going to play uh, Russell Poole. DreamWorks was behind it; they were into the making of the film. It was all proceeding accordingly, and then all of a sudden, Los Angeles Police Department, uh, obviously with incredible power and with their CIA associations closed it down and finally Johnny Depp uh, was going to play Russell Poole and uh, the whole, they were going to cover the whole Labyrinth book and scandal and all that and all that was going on Death Row Records and the killing of Tupac and Biggie and it was actually got to the point that I saw the preview in my local theater in the summer this past summer and at the last minute about a week before it was supposed to be released or maybe two weeks or so whatever they closed it down they didn't allow its release why? Some powerful forces didn't allow its release. But we don't so, know the details. We don't know the details, but uh, it's it's pretty amazing, you know, that these groups are so powerful that they can keep shutting down these uh, the revelations that Russell Poole had. And Russell Poole kept him. He he was forced to retire from the force early. Came out with his information. You know, as I say, um, a veteran reporter, Randall Sullivan. Did his book Labyrinth about it. A uh, Nick Broomfield, who, who won loads of awards in England, did his film, uh, you know, Biggie and Tupac about it. And um, and then so Russell Poole kept investigating, but so he, he was handing over evidence of who he thought the actual shooter was of Tupac to his fellow to some police officers he knew in Los Angeles and in the police precinct, and he suddenly coincidentally has a heart attack there. And, um, you know, uh, I, people close to him told me that there's, you know, loads of evidence that some of the culprits of all this were actually at that meeting 
that he didn't expect to be there and they did something to him. It wasn't a heart attack. But he died in 2015, and I've been talking to his son since then. With John Potash, what we can do is say, just talk. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's fascinating. I would just sit back and listen because you have a way of weaving all these threads together that sort of almost answer the questions that are coming up as you're talking. I'm thinking, oh, i got to ask about that. And then all of a sudden, you're, you're right into it. So uh, yeah, by all means, uh, it's really informative. Have you ever had any threats yourself or any veiled threats or, you know, people following you? Or I, I think they censor me. I mean, I, I basically, they haven't allowed, you know, my film didn't get out in the theaters. A distributor got it and decided he's just going to put it out online digitally. But um, I, th- I just think it's been censored so much um, online and other places. And, you know, you've read the, as you said, people are attacking me from all different angles. To right. Try to um, it. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit before the beginning of the show. So, you know, would you like to respond to any of that negative criticism? Like, what about the accusations that your work is essentially just left-wing propaganda designed to attack the right or that the evidence you cite is simply a collection of bits and pieces from other sources rather than anything truly original? Yeah, I, I guess I've lost track of really what left-wing and right-wing even means anymore. So originally, you know, in my first book, I did put the term leftist activist in, you know, somewhere in the title. And then my second book, uh, Drugs as Weapons Against Us, the first book again was the FBI War on Two Box Corps and Black Leaders. And in the subtitle, I have the word leftist. In the second book, Drugs as Weapons Against Us, I changed the term leftist to, and just said activist, um, because I'm starting to believe that you can't even go by these terms. These terms, right wing and left wing, seem to split us. When most of us in this country have similar values, whether we consider ourselves right wing or left wing, we don't like war. We don't like people being killed en masse. And, you know, and most of us don't believe in racism. We believe in equality. You know, to me, that's not left wing or right wing. That's just like a basic night, you know, good human value, you know. So I, I just don't even know. I mean, most of what I talk about really is, is anti war and and anti-racism, and so um, I think there's plenty of right-wing people that feel the same way. They're anti-war and anti-racism. I've actually been interviewed by people that consider themselves very right-wing, and they've been ardent supporters of my work. So I, I you know, I've been supported by far left and far right people. And you know, you mentioned Infowars and Caravan to Midnight. John Wells used to be on uh, Coast to Coast. Uh, has interviewed me twice. You know, Infowars interviewed me twice, and a uh, guy just interviewed me from, I uh, can't remember the name of the radio station, but his name's uh, Pastor Butch. And uh, everything he talked about made me think, yes, he's, you know, he, we have different values on certain areas. He's, he's definitely much more right-wing than I could ever consider, you know, my values. And my values I've always considered as left-wing, yes, it's true. But uh, I, I don't even know where I stand now because, you know, the basic tenets of, uh, you know, anti-war and anti-racism are, I think, are pretty universal. I, that's all I can say. To be fair, too, uh, from the reviews that I was reading prior to the interview here, um, most of these negative responses, they don't actually counter any of the points that you make. They just try to spin it into this uh, left-wing, right-wing thing, which almost seems like a red herring. It's like, okay, well, so what if it's left-wing or right-wing? What about the facts of the situation? Exactly. Uh, you know, what's true and what's not true and what's conjecture and what's not conjecture? And from what I can tell, yeah, there's, the threads are tenuous in some circumstances, but when you get so many of them that seem to add up to and, or at least point in the same direction, it's pretty hard to ignore yeah and, and some of the people I put on in my film like Cyril Wecht who I described before you know who talks about the Kurt Cobain death he's been on Fox News he's been on CNN he's been on MSNBC he's been on Channel 13 you know I mean ABC NBC CBS he's in his early 80s now and he's just considered one of the top national experts uh, forensic investigators and he's, you know, he's a doctor. Um, he was actually also in that film Concussion, uh, you know, in fictional form. You know, they'd say his name, I think, at one point. The but, one with uh, Will Smith? Yeah, with Will Smith. because That's he, a good he, movie, yeah. He plays yeah, a serious actor in that. Cyril Wecht, his supervisor, is Will Smith's supervisor in that film. I mean, like, you know, it's about a real 
person and Cyril Wex, the real person who really was yeah. the supervisor. Yeah. And so, um, you know, uh, he just says the facts as they are. Yeah. From what he can determine about Kurt Cobain, he was murdered and it was made to look like a suicide. So, you know, when you get people like that and when you get CIA whistleblowers and FBI whistleblowers, like I have in my film, I've got John Stockwell I mentioned. I've got CIA whistleblower uh, Phil Agee. Uh, FBI whistleblower Wes Swearingen, who was part of the FBI's counterintelligence program, which was working with MKUltra and with MH Chaos. You know, these guys, um, I don't know where they consider themselves politically, and it doesn't really matter. They're just about revealing the truth, you know? Okay, so how about a little conjecture here then, uh, extrapolation maybe. Uh-huh. If we go back in, into the history on some of this, we probably all remember Reagan's big war on drugs. Yeah. Right? So, you know, on one hand, they're saying, no, don't take it. This is your brain on drugs, right? And they had the eggs and, and then the eggs in the frying pan. And right. so, it, I mean, if the government was spending all that money trying to get people off of drugs, then how does it in any way make sense to have these, the secret program going on to try to keep people hooked on it? And on the other side of things. Yeah. Well, I argue it's a reverse psychology kind of method. First thing, they make it a black and white issue. They, you know, these comical. I, I learned about drugs through cartoons, and it's always they make it a cartoon issue. Yeah, sure. You know, if you pretend like all these drugs will kill you, and then when you try weed and it doesn't kill you, you know, like I, I remember the cartoons when I was in elementary school saying if you add weed plus alcohol, you can die. You know, it's absurd, of course. <laughs> that you, that you smoke a little weed and you drink a little beer and you don't die. You're like this, everything you're saying uh-huh. is fraudulent. You know, and um. So, you know, I think what it is, is they, they put things in black and white. They don't explore the nuances of all these drugs. And they don't, you know, and they, uh, I think it is some reverse psychology when people are saying, well, we hate Reagan and we, uh, you know, he's leading us to all these wars and doing all these terrible things. So if he doesn't want us to, to do acid, it must be good for us, you know. And that's actually what I heard from some Columbia students when I was in grad school there is that like, if the government doesn't want us to do it, it must be good for us. Because they, they appeal to these anti-establishment, folk, you know, young activists that way. And uh, I tried to tell them, well, you know, I thought that too when I was in college. But it turned out it just it really wasn't good. And then when I explored it more, I found that even though I had never had bad trips, it just really it was doing something, you know, a little harmful. And you know, I hope you don't want that even though, you know, it might be fun for a moment for a few eight hours. You're not going to like how it feels afterwards when you can't remember your, you know, what you studied, and it's hard to remember things and, you know, figure out things for your assignments and all. Well, then again, uh, wasn't there an assassination assassination attempt on Reagan? If I yeah, so I yeah, too, it was an assassination on Reagan, and it's funny because it, it really was Bush. They wanted an office, and they didn't think Bush could actually win the presidency. Reagan was just a puppet where Bush was part of the found one of the you know families that were kind of uh, in cahoots with the Rockefellers, Harrimans, and J.P. Morgan interests. You know, uh, Prescott Bush was head of Brown Brothers Harriman, which was a group that was actually trading with the Nazis. They were found guilty of trading with the enemy, and so yeah, they wanted Reagan the puppet out because he wasn't a good. They wouldn't trust him as a puppet enough, and they wanted Bush in there. Yeah, interesting. So, uh, well, of course, I'm in Canada. I don't know if we mentioned that yet, but up here, we've now got uh, legalized marijuana for recreational purposes, so long as you're of age. So what what do you think about decriminalization? Do you, do you think it would be more helpful than harmful in the in the long run? Or what, how, how does that fit into all that in your way of thinking? Yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, I, I wish it was decriminalized in the sense that I don't want people, uh, so many young people locked up over such a small crime. That's ridiculous to me. We'll talk about sure. that sure. briefly. We'll get back to the conspiracies with our vast, vast, vast <laughs> group of guests with John and Gene and Randall. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Oh yeah, I've done that. Um, well, I mean, they're, they're, sure. I mean, I, I'll admit it. I've I've inhaled, and uh, you know, it's the first yeah. time I've sort of admitted this on the show. I I, I wouldn't recommend it as an investigative tool for uh, <laughs> paranormal investigation, but there does seem to be some evidence that 
you know, the measured and positive use of psychedelics and maybe marijuana can enhance per- our perceptions and perhaps contribute to creativity in the arts and sciences. And there's some people who have made those claims. And so, you know, I think maybe in some regards, this whole plan they have a backfire has, you know, has really backfired with some people while at the same time, it's like this double edged sword almost. Well, I, I could see that. Yeah, I could agree with that. Maybe, maybe for weed in some sense, except um, I, I tell people I counsel that you just never know what you're smoking, though, because every dealer that touched it before you did had is access to your brain. And so some people I've counseled who were bulk dealers would say we would spray uh, roach killer on our weed so the wet rats wouldn't eat it all our stash where we stash yeah. it. Then you're smoking roach killer, you know. So and that's why I quit doing it for years until it recently became legal because now we have quality controls and then they can't yeah. do that sort of Sense. stuff anymore. There's a government seal on it. There's a guarantee of quality. And so, yeah. I, you know, I don't know that's any better than the stuff that was back in the 70s, but at least there's some quality control. Yeah. And the only other thing I'll say about weed, though, is, yeah, I, I don't say much about weed in the sense of, uh, in my introduction, I say, you know, uh, plenty of people I know, of course, smoke weed. But it's just a matter of every now and then is fine, but people that smoke weed every day, it starts to get, you, you start to see an effect. But kids, when they start smoking weed at like 13 or 14 years old, you see it affect grades, you see it affect their best abilities with, you know, sports and other things where it doesn't have the best outcomes. With the people I counsel, when I counsel teenagers, I don't, I see them dropping out of school way young and it makes life a lot harder. You yeah. know, when, when you're talking about young people, I mean, there's an age limit up here yeah. for it. I think some of the states down there have, have le- gone towards legalization. Or yeah. it, it is legal in some, which I think is probably a step in the right direction. Uh-huh. You know, maybe just to get back on track with the show. Sure. Because I don't really talk about any of this stuff in my book or film. I just, except for, you know, the mass incarceration of people, I, I am against that. Yeah. With weed and all. So some of these connections, though, that you have between the oligarchy and, and the entertainment industry, the government, and in particular the intelligence and military, mm-hmm. uh, and these secret mind manipulation programs, this is all really still quite fascinating. Can you delve into that? I don't even think we've touched on, like, the Grateful Dead or Bob Marley yet. Yeah, well, sadly enough, with Marley, I have a whole chapter of him in my book, in both my books, actually, because... Now, granted, he was, you know, smoking weed regularly and all that, but the CIA was seriously pushing cocaine and heroin in Jamaica in the, uh, you know, in, in the 70s and 80s. And there was a socialist prime minister of Jamaica that Marley was friends with. And so he was going to do a big concert during the next, ele- yeah, right before the next election, which was the socialist prime minister against um, the a CIA-backed, you know, opponent. And so soon before the concert, now people, you know, were, the CIA was worried that the concert was going to be seen as a, total, a complete endorsement of the, uh, you know, current socialist leader. So they shot up Marley's home. They shot Marley. They, they shot his wife. They shot his manager, Don Taylor. So the government had him, like, uh, taken into an encampment, surrounded with soldiers, surrounded with Rastas, with, to protect Marley before this concert. And so a cameraman uh, actually got into uh, a camera crew that was going to do a film about this whole concert. And um, a guy named Lee Lu Lee was a former Black Panther who was also sent, turned into a cinematographer. He said that um, this guy, he didn't know who this new technician was, but he, was, he had a great resume, so they thought he'd be helpful. And this guy um, ends up, he says, it turns out they found out that he was actually a CIA agent. And they believed he was the um, son of, uh, he was actually, I think his name was, I forgot his first name all of a sudden, but he was the son of William Colby, the one-time CIA director. And so he gave Bob Marley, he brought some shoes with him, gift shoes. He gave Bob Marley his gift boots. And the Rasta kind of tradition is to, like, try on a gift once you, you know, as soon as you get it. And so he tried on these gift boots and was stabbed in the toe with something. So no one thought anything of it. Lee Lu Lee said he saw it, but he didn't think anything of it at the time. But a few months later, um, Marley uh, crushed that toe playing soccer, and they found that it had cancer. And that whoa, cancer whoa, was- whoa, whoa, whoa! That's a good way to start. To sure. Stop right here. He had cancer. More to come with John, Gene, Randall. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> listening 
listening to GCN. Or could reveal the principal conclusions of Special Counsel Robert Mueller's Russia report as early as today. Politicians from both parties urging a quick release. Barr is reportedly reviewing that report at the Justice Department. John Potash, we are flies on the wall. So somebody is getting cancer here with the implication there was some hanky-panky with shoes? Yeah, and MK Ultra was experimenting with uh, different chemicals that would be hyper carcinogenics, you know, could cause cancer fast. And so I so I have the documents supporting that. I mean, you know, it's this has been well researched and they revealed they got about three thousand of MK Ultra documents revealed. Um the CIA had ordered them all shredded, but thirty thousand were left in the finance department. And the Senate, US Senate Church Committee came out with these documents. But anyway, so here it is in Jamaica. He gets that, you know, he gets stabbed with the uh, pin in his whatever it was in his boot. He gets cancer in that toe, and it's quickly spread throughout his body. And a few years later, he was dead. You know, so it turns out he does the concert, though. You know, at the time he did the concert, the socialist prime minister won that next election, but the uh, then lost the election after that. But uh, about around the time of the next election, uh, Bob Marley died of cancer. So, you know, it's just highly, it's believed by his um, manager, Don Taylor, that that CIA agent um, actually put something, you know, hypercarcinogenic in, in that shoe that, that got into a system and killed him. You can do it that fast? Just well, give somebody about some infected years, shoes? It takes about four years or so. It takes about four it like years. 76 to 80 or something like that, maybe 76 to 81. And he died within four or five years. Well, this is one way to get rid of some death spot in another country. Send them a free pair of shoes. Well, yeah, well, you know, it, of course, you know, more people would be uh, suspicious, I guess, of getting these shoes. But, but at first they tried to shoot them and kill them, and they, they were unsuccessful. But then they, they got to them that way, obviously. I wonder if anyone's got those boots, like as a, some sort of, you know, memento or collector's thing that they could actually get them tested by somebody. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I haven't heard if anyone found the boots that caused that. I, I don't know. I mean, that would be that would probably go for quite a bit in an auction. You'd think, yeah. But you, you were asking about someone else, too. I'm sorry. Uh, Grateful Dead, I think. Grateful They're, Dead. Yeah. Well, the Grateful Dead are very interesting because of the fact that they were the house band of the acid tests. That was Ken Kesey and the Pranksters. And um, Ken Kesey... Uh, was a graduate student at Stanford for writing, and he was also supposedly an alternate on the Olympic wrestling team. He apparently had you know, barely even gotten drunk before in his life because he was so into you know wrestling at the time. But he he was hurting for money, and so um, they were offering about 150 dollars to you know in today's prices or whatever for him to try the LSD in an experiment at the Stanford Hospital. Now this was all part of what. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. It was part of the Human Ecology Fund. Okay, it was something called the Human Ecology Fund in the early 1960s that was uh, out of Cornell Medical School. But Anthropology Today found out, you know, it had come out with a big article saying this was actually CIA money. It was coming off from MK Ultra. Um, it was all CIA money coming into the Human Ecology Fund, and they were spreading these grants to you know, psych professors. At about 45 different colleges, about 40 or 50 uh, hospitals, and 40 or 50 prisons around the country to test psychedelics on people. And so Timothy Leary was part of those grants, of course, but many, many psych professors were. And in Stanford, it was, you know, they were running these experiments out of a Stanford University Hospital where Ken Kesey was tried acid. And then after he did the acid experiments, he was given a job at the hospital as a janitor. When they gave him that job, they then also gave him the keys to the psych, to the LSD supply. He, he proceeds to steal, quote-unquote steal, loads of the <laughs> LSD <laughs> and oh, uh, proceeds to have house parties, a continual house party, just like the Millbrook Mansion where Timothy Leary was having these parties. These parties, uh, you know, uh, the Merry Pranksters were part of these parties, but they lured a lot of writers and artists around the area to these parties, but then they uh, created this psychedelic bus, and some of the people involved in creating the psychedelic bus were um, a guy named Ken Babs, who just came out of the military, who was actually still in the military, they picked up the psychedelic bus, 
the bus, Psych Dog bus, has loads of music on it. It's got um, a guy named Augustus Owsley Stanley III, better known as Owsley, was a member, as part of this Merry Pranksters and the Psych Dog bus, and he helped set it all up and supplied um, uh, lots of acid after uh, Ken Kesey stopped getting the acid you know, they were stealing from the, the supply in Stanford. And so this is 64, 65, when they take this bus to New York, for an, an event in New York, from Sanford, New York. But they do a route that goes all through the Civil Rights South, all through the southern states, and then come up to New York. And I, I argue that that was part of their agenda against the Civil Rights Movement, was promoting uh, LSD to all these young white activists that were coming down for Freedom Summer. And they end up in Watts right after the uh, race riots there. They you know, activists call them race rebellions. And they're driving through promoting LSD in Watts. I mean, not in Watts, I'm sorry. I mean in uh, Harlem, right after the race riots in Harlem. And they're promoting LSD there. And then they come back to, to the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, near Stanford. And they're having cut these acid tests I told you about before. And their house band for the acid test is the Grateful Dead. And also in attendance are John Ginger. He said in a legal deposition. Him and two of his fellow CIA scientists were there, you know, from MKUltra. And some other MKUltra agents are also there. So they're attending these acid tests. And then they take the acid test down to Los Angeles, and they go to Watts right after the uh, you know largest Los Angeles race riot of, of that era, in the Watts riots. And they're having this band play, and they have these huge vats of, of Kool-Aid that are spiked with LSD. And some people knew they were spiked, and some people didn't. But here they are in this black neighborhood of Watts. <laughs> oh, man. And all these blacks are coming in to hear the music and dancing, and they're, they're drinking all this acid, all this you know, Kool-Aid that has acid in it. You know, I have a, I have a guy actually in the uh, bonus features of the film, I have a guy describing it, um, you know, that it, everyone went into a complete meltdown at a certain point. But, um, yeah. yeah I imagine so, yeah. Yeah, they <laughs> um, couldn't control the amount of acid you were taking in these events. Oh. You know, yeah. yeah, especially if people didn't know. I mean, that's that's yeah. that part's not cool at all. Yeah. I mean, next, okay, so there's this magic bus. I mean, was that like? I wonder if that song the Who did. Yes, I it think was, it was. Yeah, that was, and and also Magical Mystery Tour was was uh, reportedly based on you know allusion to the magic bus. Yeah, they show a picture of. Um, the Beatles on this bus, you know, and, you know, going across the cover of Magical Mystery Tour, whatever it is. And that's that was their plan. That was the way they did it. Here's this weird, wild, underground, fun party bus. And look, hey, let's write about it. You know, that's, that's promoted in these songs. Yeah, Leah, part of me thinks, yeah, I really was born just a little too late. <laughs> but and on the other hand, this is a really interesting look at, at an aspect of it that probably few people really know about. So, uh, you know, thanks for bringing this to us. Sure. What's going on today with this sort of stuff? Do you, have you got any kind of an inkling of, you know, is this still going on to some extent or what's happening? Yes. Yes, it is still going on. And some of the way it's still going on is uh, the Human Ecology Fund had a lot of links to a new group that's going on still today called the Multi Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, MAPS. There's many links between MAPS and a guy named uh, William Picard, who was arrested in 2001, who was considered the largest LSD uh, trafficker in the country. And he was making his LSD in um, a missile silo, okay? <laughs> it's supposed to be an abandoned missile <laughs> That's silo. That's some irony. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just so bizarre, you know? So a lot of his very powerful associates weren't arrested, only him. So he seemed to be the fall guy. But uh, his associates were associated with MAPS, a Harvard a psychiatrist um, whose name leaves me now, a guy named Halpern, his name is Halpern, and um, another guy who was working for the government. But even Picard was still on the payroll of the government at some point. Hello? Yeah. Break time. Yeah, sure. Okay. Final segment. John, Jean, and Randall, you're in The Paracast. This is our final segment. We're bringing everything yeah, back so, to the present day. So and maybe we'll have to continue somehow. Go ahead. 
they said the other the other two other biggest institutes there are, I argue have the same connections as uh, Human Ecology Fund to the CIMK Ultra of, of the past, but it's probably continued. Is uh, the Hefter Institute, which is funded by the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers put money into both you know, Maps and the Hefter Institute, and then the the third biggest institute supporting all this and that and their their mission is promoting psychedelics I and mean, they say it they, they they promote studies of psychedelics for healthy use in their own sites you know i mean they, they fund studies all over the world to have doctors do tests that promote the use of lsd for all kinds of things so the third group is the beckley foundation and they are just um amazing because they're started by a woman named fielding who first tried to popularize tree panning. And tree panning is what I told you um, much earlier on in our radio interview, which was what John Lennon tried to do. So yeah, like this, that on some other show, Black Sails or something, and it was just like a pirate show where they were – like it's really an old technique. To, like it's, it's barbaric almost. You know, it's one thing if, if you have to do it if somebody's, you know, gone through massive head trauma and you got to, you know, relieve the inflammation. But we're talking about normal, healthy people doing this to their own skulls. Wow. So this woman Fielding actually did that on film to her own skull. She was a baroness. She's an aristocrat. She's has her own, She grew up in a castle. I think she still owns castles. And so she comes from a massive amount of money. She's royalty. And so she starts this foundation that promotes psychedelics for, you know, all kinds of medical usage and says it's the greatest thing and, you know, holds these psychedelic conferences with MAPS and the Hefter Institute. And, and that's what's being passed as like real science these days. Um, in terms of their stud, they're promoting these studies that, that ecstasy is the best treatment for PTSD. The, uh, newspapers, sadly enough, are reporting this crap is real. I mean, you know, I, I, as a trauma expert, have been taught, been trained for hour, you know, 50 hours of training in the use of something called EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing for treatment of, of uh, PTSD and also a few other techniques. But these techniques aren't invasive at all, involve no chemicals, and they do work really well for PTSD. The military even says EMDR is one of the best techniques for PTSD. Yet, these guys are trying to say ecstasy, you know, using MDMA is the best thing for PTSD. And, of course, ecstasy was originally an MKUltra drug. And ecstasy was um, found to be used in apartheid South Africa, distributed by the head of chemical warfare in the black ghettos. If there was anything I could say that would sort of counter any of that is that, that I guess when it comes to the use of these kinds of substances, there could be... I think I would ask if you know of any, but I, I think there probably are some cases where legitimate scientific therapeutic controlled studies and uh, use might be beneficial for some people. But what you're describing where some, you know, aristocrat in a castle who has no formal scientific training just decides to popularize it. I'm not sure that that's the best way to go. So it's really important, I think, if, would you agree that if anyone is going to try these things, that they are dangerous unless they're used in the supervision of actual trained professionals who know what they're doing? Yeah, I, I would say that. But I, I would say that we have to even question the authorities and the trained people because of the fact they've been so corrupted in our country. They, I feel like England's a little less corrupted, even though it's you know some problems in England. But our country is so corrupted these days that these MK Ultra type experiments. That there's a mental health uh, hospital in Baltimore that was using acid as therapy way into the 70s and started in the 60s, and they were funded by the Human Ecology Fund originally. Right. Mm-hmm. I just question authority on these issues too. Uh, sadly enough. Well, I think we have to. We have to see both sides of, of the equation here on this. And, and I mean, we know that things like uh, OPM poppies are used in a variety of medications. It can be really bad, but it can also be really helpful under certain, you know, when used, when it's supposed to be for the right reasons. So, right, sure. So, yeah, it's just, of course, it depends on the use that way, too. I agree with, with opium. And um, I don't know if cocaine can be used in a healthy way, but. But a lot of these drugs, even when they're not processed, um, like coca leaf, can be fine for people. People like you know talk about these uh, people in Central America who chew coca leaves. 
and say, oh, they're addicted to coca leaves. No, that's not the case. You don't get addicted to coca leaves. You get addicted to cocaine. For some reason, the processing of these chemicals is what makes them addictive. But a coca leaf giving you more energy to walk up a mountain, that's just a good, healthy use of it. When you have to use it so much, it starts to hurt your life in various major ways. That's when it starts to become an addiction and a problem, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, I think as an addictions counselor, yeah, that part is obvious and you'd have to, I'd have to agree with that completely. So is there anything you'd like to, to say just to wrap up? Well, guys, if you want to see all the people I was talking about in this interview, you can see them in my film, Drugs as Weapons Against Us, the CIA War on Musicians and Activists. But granted, that's like a, it's a two hour film and uh, two hour films are based on about like 60 page scripts. I'm sorry. The book is about 450 pages. So all the details you can find in the book and all the end notes for the sources there and all that stuff. I appreciate you guys, you know, talking about all this controversial stuff and helping uh, your listeners find out more about it all. Let me ask you a vast question here. Sure. If you were to ask anyone in the government uh-huh. about any of this, would they just say, oh, that's a lot of nonsense, it's wacky? What kind of response would they have, well, or have you asked them? Well, in 1991, I attended a conference that Ramsey Clark was speaking at, and he's the former U.S. Attorney General under Lyndon Johnson. I was working as an addictions counselor then, you know, and I said, what do you think the government is using drugs for? You know, what, what do you think they're doing with drugs? And he said, well, I think the government is using drugs to sedate and divide the masses. So that's one of the highest up former government officials in his response. Of course, that, that was partly what helped me develop my theories, of course, was his response. If I would ask someone now who's deeply involved in it, I don't even know how I would ask him in a way that I wouldn't be scared. But I guess I'd say, do you really want to hurt so many lives? Don't you think you could just try to convince people of of, what you, of the way you want things to be? But I, I just feel like their answer would be, no, they know better. They know they can't convince all these people to say, give me all your money because, you know, and here's how we can control you to, so we can have more of your money and you can have less of your money. Because that's what they're doing. A lot of it's really about social control for the rich to get richer and the poor to not be able to rise up and change things for the better or the middle class either. I take it then that the men in black have not come to you and asked you to shut up about this stuff. Not yet, and hopefully they don't. <laughs> and hopefully, you know, it's uh, I stay under the radar enough that they don't think take me too seriously. We'll see. I guess be careful what you wish for. Tell our listeners if they want to know more about the things you do, where do they go? Yeah, so you can buy the book on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble. If it's on the shelf at Barnes & Noble, they say they'll get it in the store within two or three days. For the film, you can see it on Amazon Prime. It's streaming now on Amazon Prime. It's also in places like Vimeo and Voodoo. The film is also being sold at places like online Target and Walmart and Barnes & Noble and Amazon, Best Buy. But the first book is only sold on Amazon and at independent bookstores, the FBI War on Tupac Shakur and Black Leaders. You know, I found that Jimi Hendrix evolved to be very political in the last year or two of his life also. He majorly politicized by the assassination of Martha King. He went to mourning after Martha King's assassination and started talking about the Black Panthers, dedicated his last album to the Black Panthers, talked about them in interviews. And then Tupac Shakur grew up in a Black Panther family and was born into activism and was actually a leader of uh, New African Panthers when he was only 17 years old. And they were a national Black activist group. And Kurt Cobain was very political and very anti-war and very anti-racism. You know, a lot of people, the musicians I cover, were activists in and of themselves, besides the other activists I cover, such as, of course, the Black Panthers and the Students for a Democratic Society, who are arguably the largest you know, student anti-war group in history, with 100, being 100,000 strong before they split up in 1969. The thing I wonder about here is you take a person with the prominence of a John Lennon. And I'll mm-hmm. tell you a story about that Give Peace a Chance song in a moment. But you take somebody like that and you go after him or her. You only draw attention to what they're doing. They have the public platform. Now, I'll give you the story before we go on with that. Story is, I was working at a radio station in Vermont around the time that John and Yoko did their bed in or lie in in a Toronto hotel. I think that's where they recorded Give Peace a Chance. I learned about it from 
a wire service story. So I called the hotel, see if I could get an interview, right? Missed him by one day. There you go. Yeah, that's, that's nice that you almost get some. Sorry you didn't get that interview. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, sure. More, more so I am. But seriously speaking here, though. Yeah. It doesn't seem stupid, to me at least, that you go after people with a high profile. If you're going to do that, do it on the QT if you can. Yeah, well, of course, they tried to do it without anyone's knowledge. They didn't try to do it overtly. They didn't tell everyone, we're following John Lennon and we're tapping his phone. You know, as John Lennon said, you know, I believe my phone's tapped. I don't know it, but I, I hear things. I, you know, when I pick it up, I see people that, that don't even, you know, that are clearly constantly behind me and constantly watching from across the street. And so it wasn't, you know, overt. It was covert. That's the way it works usually. And um, that's the way it was with John Lennon. And the same thing with Jimi Hendrix. He didn't know that the FBI had him under 24-hour surveillance. That was only found out. After his death, after people went after his, you know, FBI records, these kinds of situations they they really scare a lot of these musicians. Remember, these musicians were not very old at this time, and despite being so influential musically, they didn't know that much about how to deal with the politics of it all. And so here, John Lennon was going to lose his American voice because he was going to be kicked out of America, you know, sent back to London for good, deported, and then of course he was done in. In 1980, uh, he went into hibernation for about five years, as you know, in the mid 70s, uh, till about 1980. And while he was in hibernation, he did produce his two albums that you know uh, were you know, instantly popular when he came back. But he also announced he was going to lead a Teamsters march, and he announced that to Newsweek. And so, after his death, that came out that he was you know going to get back into activism too. And so it was you know very sad, of course, to lose him when we did, but. A London attorney who is also a, um, a daily news journalist named Fenton Bressler did a seven-year investigation of John Lennon's murder, and he came to find that Mark David Chapman was actually – they used that the CIA used a, a program that used hypnosis and drugs to get him to do what he did. And it was actually – Fenton Bressler showed the CIA connections to local police intelligence units, and there was one particular police officer – who guided Mark David Chapman, trained him in shooting, and gave him the hollow, hollow point bullets with which to kill uh, John Lennon, with which he shot at John Lennon. And so um, that's just some of the massive evidence of CIA involvement. Another um, author named Phil Strongman, who was a, a veteran music reporter in, in London, who's written a number of great music books, decided to write the book about John Lennon's assassination, where he says that another man who was involved in the assassination was a, a guy named Jose Sanjernis Perdomo. And he was part of the Bay of Pigs invasion, and he was uh, considered a CIA hitman. And so he became the doorman that night at the Dakota Apartments where John Lennon lived, and he was believed to have aided in that assassination. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere, or maybe not. This is going to be a real fascinating discussion. Out of our normal paranormal coverage, John Potash is joining us. And once again, John is author of Drugs as Weapons Against Us, subtitle, The CIA War on Musicians and Activists. Oh, boy. About what year, just before the break there, you were saying that this these documents came out that indicate that the CIA was involved in actually training Chapman to, to, or somehow influencing him to carry out the assassination. Now, when did those documents surface? Uh, Fenton Bressler published his book in 1989. And so he had done a Freedom of Information Act request on the FBI documents. They got uh, two or 300 of them, but they alluded to CIA documents also. I believe he only got two or three pages of the CIA documents. They, he just couldn't get the, you know, those documents from the CIA despite filing these freedom of information requests. So, you know, with his book in 1989, you know, a lot of this information came out. But again, uh, this is what, you know, his evidence, he says, explains and supports. But the actual CIA documents saying we trained Mark David Chapman, no, he couldn't get them. He couldn't get them, you know, explicitly, no. Something's up with that, though. I mean, I've always suspected that myself. So, you know, mm -hmm. 
and right about that time too, I think there was some other people sort of saying, well, look, you know, was this just all him talking, you know, with the voices in his head kind of thing? The, the CIA, we know, and we talked about this in other shows, where the CIA actually had technology where they could make sounds appear in people's heads from a distance. And now it's come out into the public and it's used in advertising, uh, street advertising. Now, who's to say? I mean, this sounds like it could be something that's plausible. Yeah, and so when when the uh, police officers got Mark David Chapman, brought him into the precinct, the commander of that precinct, which happened to be a, you know, a huge precinct, there's a million people in that one New York precinct, when he was interviewed by Fenton Bressler, he told Bressler that it appeared that you know, David Chapman, about him you know, analyzing Chapman, ta- trying to talk to Chapman, he said it appeared that he'd been programmed. And he said, I know what you're going to make of that term, but that's what it appeared to me. It appeared to me that Mark David Chapman had actually been programmed. Yeah. Is that the same doorman that you were talking about that had the uh, the military training? No, no. Oh, I'm saying okay. the, the head of the police precinct when he got Mark David Chapman. Now, oh, they, okay. They first actually, when they when the police first came there, they actually thought that uh, Jose Sanjanis Perdomo was the shooter. But uh, he somehow, they somehow didn't touch him. They didn't arrest him. He was never, um, you know, looked at further. He somehow, you know, through, I guess, his connections, I don't know. He was not looked at more after that. The, apparently, you know, when the police first came, they really, really thought it was him, not Chapman. But, you know, we, you know, everyone believes, and I, and I believe, of course, that Chapman, of course, did fire shots. The question is, there's evidence that more shots than just Chapman, you know, came at uh, John Lennon, just to be sure that the job was done successfully. And that's oh, that's where, interesting. Where I, I hadn't heard that. that that's, yeah, uh, that's really from Phil Strongman's book, um, The Life and uh, Death and or Assassination of John Lennon. Yeah. Looking at the aftermath of this, didn't that bring more attention to John Lennon and what he did than having left him alone? Yeah, the, the issue was is Reagan was coming to power at that time. You know, Reagan and Bush, and they were coming in with all kinds, you know, a huge right wing agenda that was going to try to roll out, you know, a lot of changes in the country and a lot of major, you know, foreign policy initiatives, you know, such as, you know, taking over, you know, places in, in Central America, being involved in all this stuff with the uh, Contra cocaine issues and all that. And so here was John Lennon, a big voice to oppose those policies. And once he's dead, he can't oppose those policies. He can't actively continue to oppose those policies. And so that's why I say that um, they wanted to take out a voice for peace, a voice against the right-wing policies, and et cetera. Right, like cut off the the head of the leaders, so to speak. Right, and it, and the, exactly. And then the crowd tends to dissipate to some extent. Right. Of course, in that case, a lot of people came together. and But then, it, then it's... It's true, like what you say, you know, with the continuing focal point gone, there wasn't the same sort of focus to really target that specific type of political movement. What about the uh, role of drugs in this now? Because we've got drugs is in your book. And by the way, for our listeners, we've got the link to the movie and to the book and to John Potash's website right on our forum. So if you want to find out more, including get the movie, you can come to the forum, click there, and you'll be able to get it there. So the film, yeah, the film's easier than the uh, subtitle of the book. The film is Drugs as Weapons Weapons Against Us, The CIA War on Musicians and Activists. And so drugs comes into play in the fact that in uh, 1953, the CIA started a project called MKUltra. This project MKUltra, and... It was really an umbrella project that, um, and with 149 sub projects underneath it. And it was started by the Rockefellers, uh, you know, the Harrimans, the JP Morgan family interests, the Carnegies, the Vanderbilts. They had all had the most influence over starting the CIA. And in effect, with the National Security Act of 1947, they made the CIA above the law. And this is according to uh, top CIA whistleblowers like Victor Marchetti, who wrote the book The Cult of Intelligence, uh, Francis Stoner Saunders, a British magazine editor, who wrote the book The Cultural Cold War, The CIA, Arts and Letters. And so they showed that these families started, you know, the CIA, 
made them above the law, had them doing things outside the law, and one of those things was Project MKUltra, which in its own document said, we're, we're exploring the use of drugs as unconventional warfare. And they tested about three dozen different drugs on thousands of different soldiers. Here in my state, it was uh, Edgewood Arsenal soldiers. They, they used a thousand Edgewood Arsenal soldiers to test these drugs. And they were all kinds of drugs, but many of the street drugs that we know were first start tested you know, on these soldiers by MKUltra experiments. And uh, one of actually the largest drugs they, they tested was LSD. Uh, of course, they also tested, you know, the use of opium and cocaine and uh, benzos and ecstasy and, you know, what was formerly known as ecstasy, M MDA versus MDMA, which is, was the precursor to MDMA. So um, they found out all the effects, and then they started to use them as to weaponize them. Now, the U.S. Senate Church Committee analyzed MKUltra in the mid-1970s. But first, John F. Kennedy came upon MKUltra when he came into office in 1961, and he immediately closed down MKUltra. But he replaced the CIA director, but the second command of the CIA kept, kept the project going behind Kennedy's back. He just changed the name to MK Search. Let's search our break here, sure. John, and we'll get back in the next segment, MKUltra. John Kennedy, that raises the other conspiracy theory. More to come with John, Gene, and Randall. You're in the Paracast. John Kennedy, having done what he did to the CIA, is that one of the motives or key motive why they took him out? I believe it's one of a number of motives. Uh, I mean, not, yeah. I mean, part of it is uh, ending, you know, trying to squash MKUltra. Part of it is turning back on the Vietnam War. You know, of course, he started initiating uh, more troops to Vietnam War, and then he changed his mind and started pulling them back. And so I have, uh, you know, various clips, film, film clips, of Kennedy talking about pulling the troops back, of, uh, you know, analysts who said, we have on record Kennedy ordering to take, get all troops out of Vietnam by 1965. And so, yeah, that, that was another part of it, sure. And, and why such intense interest in Vietnam? Why did the most powerful families want Vietnam so much? And, you know, why they care about it? Because that was the golden triangle for poppy fields. So I have uh, CIA whistleblower John Stockwell talking about how his, his fellow CIA agents were flying um, out of Vietnam with the heroin, the opium and the heroin from Vietnam into the United States. And I also have Judy Woodruff of Frontline um, in the 1970 documentary talking about the fact that she interviewed a, n a number of people, people that flew the uh, the heroin, heroin from Vietnam to the U.S., people that watched the heroin being loaded into the uh, CIA planes, Air America. So and she says that, yes, the you know, CIA was clearly uh, trafficking heroin from Vietnam to the United States and showed the CIA memo admitting to it. You know, it's clear cut. And here with Kennedy trying to pull us out of Vietnam, they were losing access to the best poppy fields in the world for growing heroin, you know, for growing uh, poppy fields, opium and heroin. And now, of course, the second best place in the world is the Golden Crescent for poppy fields, which is at the other end of the same mountain range, the Himalayan mountain range. And that lies in the Afghanistan area. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, so, yeah, I show that's not a coincidence that fought the longest war. First, Vietnam War is the longest war in U.S. history, but then the Afghanistan War surpassed that. Yeah, that that's really, I think, overlooked by a lot of people that, that don't really look at anything but to sort of, well, it's all the Taliban and the, uh, you know, the anti-Islamic sentiment that goes along with that. And they, they don't recognize that the opium trade there is huge or the poppy the poppy growing trade is enormous. And, and I read somewhere that in Germany, they've constructed enormous sheltered fields for poppies to make up for the loss because of this problem with the war there. So you know that companies are right. making in or at least have billions of dollars invested in this mm -hmm. particular trade that is connected with the war and then... Let's try to connect this back to, to John Lennon, though. Now, I yeah. remember reading in his biography something to do with John Lennon getting pretty heavy into LSD at one point. He did. And he also got into heroin. You know, he had that song, Me and My Monkey, about the monkey on his back, about his heroin addiction at one point. Right, heroin. So, 
Yeah, he had a problem with both drugs. And the question is, how did he get started? All right, and so uh, a guy named a writer named A.E. Hotchner was a uh, was Ernest Hemingway's editor and longtime friend, and he wrote a book called Blown Away about the Rolling Stones. And in that book, he revealed that in 1965, the deputy director of MK Ultra, Robert Lashbrook, came to London with loads of agents, loads of lots of money, and tons of LSD. And it was at the beginning of 1965. And he instructed those agents to get the LSD in as many musicians' hands as possible. Okay, and I, as I told you, in the, the MK Ultra documents list LSD is one of their top drugs to be used for unconventional warfare. So later in 1965, uh, John Lennon and his wife and George Harrison and his, his girlfriend were having dinner at uh, George Harrison's dentist. And they proceed to dose George Harrison and John Lennon. They put LSD in their coffee without their knowledge. And so John Lennon was furious. And George Harrison said, what's LSD? I've never heard of it. And from that point on, they were introduced to LSD for the first time. They were, you know, granted, they didn't want to do it again because they're furious about the way they started it. But people slowly but surely started to influence them. Well, maybe you should try it again. A year later, they're at a party in the, the Laurel Can like near the Laurel Canyon area of Los Angeles, where David Crosby's throwing a party with Peter Fonda and some other people. And they convinced that you know, Beatles, uh, John Lennon, George Harrison, Ringo Starr at that time, to uh, try it again. And after that, more people, you know, kind of influenced them that yeah, it's fun and it's normal and it's cool and it's the thing to do. And so he got he got into it. He got way too into it, obviously. So there was a point in '69 where he really said he was having so many bad trips he thought he was losing his mind. The head was so messed up from so much uh, tripping that he said he considered drilling a hole in his head. It was something called tree panning. He would drill a hole in his skull to expand his consciousness. And some mainstream biographies of John Lennon said he was actually considering this. Now, he also, it also LSD also affects your emotional control. So John Lennon when he went solo, he was getting super nervous before all his concerts, and he was throwing up for an hour or more before his shows because people lose a little bit of emotional control. And, you know, I've tried acid myself about a half a dozen times, and what I got out of it was I, my grades dropped drastically for about a year or more. You know, the, uh, some top studies say that are hard to find studies, but they say that there's some damage going on. It's very mild, but there's definitely damage going on, and so took me a while to, to get my grades back up, but at the same time, I uh, never got back certain skills, and a close friend of mine in college had the exact same thing happen to him. So I didn't think much of it, but I found that these studies say that whether it's the, they're not sure it's the acid itself or the strychnine that's added to the acid. Most acid is cut with additives, and strychnine is the most popular additive, and strychnine's rat poison. This is some of what's going on with this stuff when they popularize it. So they came to find that the top underground, supposedly underground, LSD trafficker in the world was a guy named Ron Stark. He had acid laboratories on several continents. He was involved in the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, which Timothy Leary was involved in. Timothy Leary ended up admitting that he knew he was working for the CIA since 1963. Brotherhood of Eternal Love was funded by the Mellon Hitchcocks, and the Mellon Hitchcocks owned uh, Mellon Bank and Gulf Oil, and also had members in top positions in U.S. intelligence. And so they were one of the wealthiest families in the world. They were obviously behind a lot of the spread of the acid, but this Ronald Stark was caught in uh, 1974 in Italy with his, his acid trafficking, and um, the top detective who caught him, a guy named Dick Lee, wrote a book saying that him and his network with the Brotherhood of Eternal Love nationally were responsible for like over 100 million hits of LSD being trafficked in Britain in three years alone. So he had a huge network, and so the first judge to try his case was murdered. The second judge let him off, saying he offered numerous proofs that he was a member of, the, of U.S. intelligence since 1960, so we're going to let him go. Dick Lee talked about his uh, U.S. intelligence work, you know, Ronald Stark, and, and that's what, what that was about. But that just shows where this all comes from. And so a good writer named Martin Lee, who founded Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, wrote a book called Acid Dreams, where he interviewed a number of countercultural veterans of the 60s, and they all said, we believe that, yes, the CIA was distributing this acid to take away the potency of the anti-war movement, including ourselves. They, they were trying to hurt us and hurt our movement and divert people from their best activism.
Wow, that's that's really fascinating stuff. I have when, a related uh, comment to make in our next segment. Sure. Okay. Sure. And we'll do that in a moment. Should remind everybody that the best way to support the power, the mm-hmm. legend here of rock stars dying at the age of 27, Kurt Cobain, of course, from, you know, several other stars. Mm-hmm. They died at the age of 27. Yeah. Any reason why that happened or what? Yeah, so in my film, again, the film is, uh, people can see it on Amazon Prime, but it's Drugs as Weapons Against Us, the CIA War on Musicians and Activists, and it's based on the book, book Drugs as Weapons Against Us. I don't get into that uh, 27 Club, they call it, but uh, people enough people have asked me about it, like yourself, that I will say that in my first book, I talked about an anniversary timing tactic I found with the FBI and U.S. intelligence in general in their assassination of Martha King and a few other incidents. I talk about high-level incidents in my book. So, you know, Martha King, I'll just give an example that uh, exactly one year, the anniversary, one year after his uh, official announcement against the Vietnam War, which was highly publicized, you know, his one of his top, uh, the top researchers of his assassination Argue, you know, says that that, that doesn't appear to be a coincidence. And I show how it, it, there's a number of uh, times that that has happened, these kind of anniversary timing tactics with assassinations. And so I would argue that um, a number of these musicians that were activists, like uh, John Lennon, like Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, as you mentioned, Janis Joplin, and I cover them all in my book and film. And also Brian Jones, who I cover extensively in my book, but um, I, sorry to say, got cut from my film, though it's supposed to be in bonus features that are coming out. They all got into the anti-war movement. They all became active in the anti-war movement. And I and they got active by about the age of 25 or 6. And I argue that um, when they're all killed about the same age, I think it, it puts a subconscious message into people's minds that if you go against the, the powers that be, this is what can happen to you. And, and that's what you know their anniversary timing tactic achieves. So we have Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, and of course, Kurt Cobain, and maybe there are others. Those are the ones that yeah. come to mind. But I think when most people look at that, they think of maybe some curse or maybe the rock star reaches a point there where they are doing things to excess. And they basically kill themselves. Yeah, and so I show the evidence that it wasn't natural for all these musicians to be excessive about drugs. Drugs were pushed on them like crazy by undercover agents and by the the powers that be that influenced them through the allegedly underground culture. Now, a lot of the underground magazines, some of them were truly underground magazines, you know, that were political magazines, and some were for cultural reasons. But I, I found evidence that a lot of them were... Uh, what you call an astroturf campaign, which in, in public relations industry is fake grassroots. They start these papers that are supposedly underground but are really funded by big money, and they push an agenda. And their the big agenda they were pushing was Timothy Leary's agenda with you know um, all he was doing uh, with pushing you know, turn on, tune in, drop out, which is you know use LSD and drop out of uh, the real world and drop out of activism. He was saying to activists, you know, you have menopausal minds. You should be searching for spiritual truths, not being involved in political activism. And so they had all these underground, supposedly underground, you know, newspapers that were pushing the Timothy Leary agenda and promoting Timothy Leary. And they influenced all these young musicians who didn't know a whole lot better that, okay, you know, Timothy Leary is the man you should have on stage for you when the Rolling Stones played, um, you know, I'm so Audemars, it was called, which was like the second Woodstock, they called it. And so they had Timothy Leary in, in all these beans. They had these fake grassroots, you know, parties. And you know, the acid tests were attended by top MKUltra scientists, according to a legal deposition from the top psychologist at MKUltra, a guy named uh, John Gittinger. So this is some of how this all happened. There, there was these fake grassroots parties, the acid tests. Um, and in the TRIPS Festival, is, uh, John Gittinger and two other CIA sci- MKUltra scientists attended that. You know, they turned into human beings or they tested tons of psychedelics on, on activists at the human beings. They did the same thing when they set up Timothy Leary at the uh, Millbrook Estate of 
Billy Mellon Hitchcock. His, his, they set him up in his mansion, which is the central part of his 3,000 acre estate of an hour north of New York City. And they lured all these great artists, writers, and musicians up from New York City to this constant party at the Millbrook Mansion. And M. Kelcher scientists were just stay, you know, hanging out there trying all different kind, kinds of psychedelics one of these great artists and musicians and having them, you know, then spread the idea throughout society. And, you know, and so that's some of the way that they, you know, made the sex, drugs and rock and roll the thing when really, you know, people would naturally love rock and roll and naturally love sex, but the drugs was inserted in between them to make it uh, seem like it's just natural too. Not that we wouldn't experiment, but to naturally love something that's hurting our mind. Nah, I don't think so. At least to the degree that it was hurting some people because of the way that it was being administered. In some cases, you were saying these people were being dosed without even their knowledge. Right. Which is, which is really, like, that's really bad. The head of Columbia SDS also, the head, head of Columbia's Students for Democratic Society, um, That when that uh, group held a party in uh, 68 or 69, um, an undercover agent, George Generally, was part of a group called the Crazies, which was an offshoot of Abby Hoffman jippies and they they uh, dosed the punch at their party and, and got them tripping for the first time. Yeah, that's really not cool. Um, there's some people, of course, that have, when you start, you know, just going back to Lennon briefly, uh, that Ono was somehow involved with some kind of an intelligence system of some sort, and that in in the book, in uh, his biography, she was responsible, according to the book, for supplying Lennon with a lot of his pure LSD, like in liquid form. And then we have uh, something sort of similar going on with uh, Kurt Cobain. And we've got a question in our question bank bank here, so maybe you could uh, sort of draw some parallels there, or, or fill in some of the blanks. Cy Chris asks, I'd love to hear about Courtney Love's connection to the CIA, her involvement in Kurt's murder. Mm -hmm. And he says that in quotes because I'm not sure that it's ever been proven and who her real dad is, uh, whatever that's about. Yeah, well, yes, I get heavily into I have a whole chapter just on Courtney Love because of what, you know, what that guy just asked that question on. That's that's a good question. And I'll, I'll I have a She's a very complicated story, but um, yes, yeah, she. W- I, I think she, you know, does have a parallel to Yoko Ono. Now, I don't. I just raise questions about Yoko Ono. I don't uh, assume anything. But a, 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 th- a biography that came out within the past year from a journalist who was close to the Beatles in Britain, he says that Yoko Ono got John Lennon using heroin um, for the first time. And so um, I believe that. And, uh, again, I'm, I don't know. He knows better than me. He was close to the Beatles. But um, she did come from the wealthiest, one of the wealthiest families in Japan, and her actions are very suspicious. I just don't, I don't get heavily into that. When, when John Lennon did think he was losing his mind, Yoko Ono, from doing too much acid, uh, Yoko Ono tried to convince him that no, you're fine. No, you know, keep keep using acid. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, one so, thing I wanted you know, to bring up here about Yoko Ono because I've been reading stuff about the Beatles in general. Supposedly, mm-hmm. here Paul McCartney sicked Yoko Ono on John because she was hanging around, like she's trying to land or bed a Beatle, and McCartney said no and sent her off to Lennon, and supposedly she hung around for, what, about a year or so before Lennon finally succumbed to her wiles or whatever. That's interesting. Now, I, I didn't hear exactly that way, but you could be right. I, um, yeah, she's, look, I, I can't, I can't say, I don't get that, you know, um, deep into her, her story. I wrote a bit, I wrote a paragraph or two about some of her history, and I raised some of these questions. But, um, I, you know, because I, I have so much other evidence around these actually, you know, we, these agents that we know about, you know, in terms of in, in the evidence we know about regarding the uh, life and death of John Lennon that um, I just focus more on them, the, the concrete evidence I had. Now, regarding Kurt Cobain, though, I'll just say, I mean, I'm sorry to leave Lennon if you don't want to leave Lennon just yet. But with Cobain, it was so much more um, clear cut in my mind. Now, a guy named, uh, who I've become friendly with, uh, Ben Statler, who's an actor turned director, made a movie called Soaked in Bleach about, um, Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love. 
And uh, he, he just shows mounds and mounds of evidence of how Courtney Love played a part in, uh, in Kurt Cobain's death. And so here they were bringing in you know, loads of heroin, and so they had all this demand. They had all the supply. So I argue that they need to match demand, match supply. And the way they did that is to psychologically profile musicians the same way they did in the 1960s. Now, I'll just say in the 60s, they had also uh, targeted Mick Jagger because it came out in the London, the London Daily Mail that um, uh, undercover FBI agent Dave Schneiderman was also working for MI5 when he convinced Mick Jagger to use LSD for the first time in 1967 at a party of Keith Richards and gave him his first hits of acid. And then police came in and arrested them, and they promoted the fact that they were all tripping, promoting acid that way. But they didn't, of course, arrest Schneiderman, they, you know. So anyway, so here we, we're in the uh, late 80s, and they're, they're getting all this heroin in the United States in the early 90s. And so they, I, I argue that they psychologically profiled these musicians. Kurt Cobain had a massive stomach problem. He, he admitted in his journals that he tried uh, heroin about six times in four years between 1986 and 1990. And uh, so he produces Nevermind. It's rising up the chart extremely fast, you know, up the music charts. And into his life, all of a sudden, appears this woman Courtney Love. She's you know, dating Billy Corgan at that, at that night, you know, at this party. And she immediately leaves her date, Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins, and just leeches on to uh, Kirk Cobain. They start dating, and she gets um, knocked up. You know, she gets pregnant within a few months. But all their friends in Seattle, all the people that knew them in Seattle, said that she got Kurt Cobain using heroin daily for the first time in his life. It solved his massive stomach problem. Everyone knows that like a tincture of opium is in, uh, you know, some of those uh, like I forget the names of those things. But either way, so he solved this stomach problem a little bit with the heroin at first. Then he found I have him, you know, one film saying he found a medication that finally worked for his stomach. A year before his death, he told Rolling Stone magazine this on film, and uh, he was so relieved they found you know a medication that worked for him after searching for so long. And so then there was a, a blood test done on Kurt Cobain a month before his death when he had a coma in Rome. And in that blood test, the doctor said there was no illegal substances in his you know body at all except for rohypnol. Now rohypnol is also called roofies. And Rohypnol was a sleep medication in England, and that's where, you know, it was Courtney Love's sleep medication, because in England you can use it for sleep legally. It's a legal drug in, in England. But so she was stay, uh, hanging out in London at the time. She comes over to Rome with her daughter Frances to let, you know, uh, curtsy Francis while he's on tour in Rome. And he proceeds to go into a coma because uh, the best evidence is that she loaded a drink of his with lo loads of her Rohypnol and sent him into a coma and, and of course you forget everything that happened because it's you know it's you know roofies now as an addictions counselor i'm a counselor myself and i started as an addictions counselor and now i of course counsel on other issues also but someone who doesn't have heroin that's in their system must not have been using for at least three to five days because it stays in your system at least three to five days in detectability and a heroin addict needs his heroin every single day you know that too. I'm sure everyone knows that. Or you go through massive withdrawals. So he was obviously not a heroin addict at least a month before his death. Yet at his death, uh, Cyril Weck, the Ameri head of the American Academy of Forensic Science, at one time said on film that there was enough heroin in Cobain's system to, to kill at least three severe addicts. Okay. And Cyril Weck also said on film for Channel Nine News in Pittsburgh, where he works that um, he believes that Cobain was murdered and was made to look like a suicide. And I have him in my film saying that for you know, Channel 9 News. Yes, there's a lot of evidence that he was murdered, and he was divorcing Courtney Love. I have his lawyer, Rosemary Carroll, on tape saying that, uh, that somebody copied his handwriting to produce this you know, supposed suicide note. And um, he, he was, you know, uh, divorcing Courtney at that time. He had told Rosemary Carroll to take her out of his will. And Rosemary Carroll said they were hateful by that time of his death. And uh, Courtney Love said, get me the best divorce lawyer you could possibly find. Um, and so that's what was going on at that time. Wow. What about this question? Um, he asked CIA. where, uh, no, who her real dad is. 
Yeah, so her biological dad was Hank Harrison, and so I interviewed him for about two hours, and because uh, he wrote a book called Love Kills about his his daughter's you know aid in the murder of Kurt Cobain, and the story of that is that so he him and his partner at the time, a woman who calls herself Linda Carroll now, they had Courtney you know, they had Courtney Love together, and so but they separated after Courtney Love's birth, and uh, so they're co-parenting from afar, you know, separated. They never actually got married, but um. So when Courtney was about four or five years old, there was a custody battle. And now Linda Carroll's parents were a couple named the Reese's. They owned uranium mines. They owned huge stock in Bosch and Lum. They were ex- extremely wealthy. And she, so in Linda Carroll's memoir, she said her father sexually abused her as a, as a kid. And so they paid off Hank Harrison's uh, lawyer to to lose the case for him, and he lost complete custody of, uh, you know, Courtney Love. Didn't see her again for years, and he went into a depression, he said. So then come when she's about 13 years old, her her mother had kind of given up on her. She's in a juvenile delinquent facility, and she writes a letter to um, to Hank Harrison saying that, you know, I, I've been, uh, my, you know, I've been, of course, she was going to counseling from the age of three years on, which is very really bizarre. Which says my counselors were giving me psychohypnotic drugs, and she listed the psychohypnotic drugs, which, which are exotic drugs that were part of MK Ultra for for use in hypnosis. And she also said my counselors were all having sex with me. So of course, you know, Hank Harrison uh, got her, you know, worked on getting her out of the juvenile delinquents uh, facility, he got her in custody of her again, and didn't realize she had turned into a monster. She was leaving heroin syringes all over his house. She was prostituting. By the age of 14, a mainstream biographer named uh, Melissa Rossi wrote a book um, about Courtney Love where she identifies uh, Love as working uh, as a stripper for the Japanese mafia in Japan at 14 years old. And then she proceeded to work for the Taiwanese mafia uh, a few years later. And, in, and she got a hold of letters that, from that Courtney Love had written to an old boyfriend that said she was prostituting at that time. So this is just some of the crazy evidence of Courtney Love. But Courtney Love proceeds to visit Hank Harrison when he's uh, doing research in Dublin for a uh, a book. He was a writer. And so she had just turned 17 years old. She comes there to visit him. And a, a new guy befriended Hank Harrison in Dublin, the guy named Stephen O'Leary. And Stephen O'Leary latches on to Courtney Love, proceeds to, to travel with her for six weeks to, into uh, London. And she she takes a thousand hits of acid to London and spreads them around to the musicians in Liverpool and, and London and like their candy and she proceeds to copy the same do the same thing in Portland in Los Angeles and in you know Seattle and I show how that copies uh, Robert Lashbrook what Robert Lashbrook did for the CIA's MK Ultra program you know in the 60s 